Welcome everyone to our adult education summer series. We are so excited to welcome you back. And it looks like our numbers are ticking up, which means that everybody is coming into the webinar and getting settled. So um, I'm gonna let everybody get into the Zoom, which sounds almost foreign now as things are starting to open up. Um, and we're so excited that they are. Let's see, let's see how many people are coming in. Okay. My name is Amy Lerman and I'm a speech language pathologist and community outreach at the parish school. And um, I am so excited to welcome you to be here with us for our adult education series. We have our summer series going on, which is a little bit different than our usual, which um, normally we have one of these a month, but during the summer, we like to pack them in and do them um, once a week during our camp that we have going on right now, Camp Acorn on the Parish School campus. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna talk about what I'm gonna be talking about this evening. Normally when we have adult education, um, I'm introducing somebody else, but today it's just me. And I'm here to talk about developing social competence. I really, really love this talk. This one um, was actually um, originally developed by Stephanie Heinz, who is our director of social learning at the Karuth Center, which was formerly at the parish school. And um, over the years, we've kind of tweaked it together and changed it. But what I love most about this talk is that the information is um, really user-friendly. And, uh, what I will say about this one is that typically it is our most engaging and interactive talk. But with this uh, platform, this webinar platform, I'm not gonna be able to, um, to do that piece of it. So what I'm hoping that you will do is to create images in your mind of the social situations that, um, that, I, that I discuss and um, we'll see where that goes from there. So let me go ahead and pull up mm -hmm, my slideshow. All right. So Amy, I don't think we can see your slideshow. Oh, is it not? It's not pulling up? No, oh, we dear. can just see you. You just see me. Oh, dear. Let me. Okay. I'm so glad you jumped in, Meredith. That Wait, I, I think. Hold on. It might have been working. I'm getting. I'm trying to figure out if other people can see it. I couldn't see it. Okay, no, they can't see it. Okay, they can't see it. Okay. Well, let me go back. Okay, yeah. To okay, this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for letting us know. Okay. Let me go back to full screen. We'll try this again. Thank you for being so communicative so that we can figure out. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. All right, that is what I wanted to do. Here we go, let's try this again. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. Thanks, Mayor. Oh, 
<laughs> Whoop, let me pause that and we'll go back here and um as we get into um the talk this evening what i would like you all to put in your minds is that gentleman that grown gentleman and all of the different things that he was doing and saying and the expressions on the other spaces and try to imagine what those people were thinking about and feeling as he was doing those things. And we'll use that as a jumping off point. So speaking of jumping, before we can get into thinking about how to teach children social competence, we actually have to make sure that we can differentiate between different types of social events. So we're going to look at a list. And typically when I do this, I have my participants openly vote about which events require social and which do not. So let's go for it. Playdates, birthday parties, playground, watching a movie alone at a theater, attending a sporting event, grocery shopping, learning in a classroom, the drive through at Starbucks, taking your dog for a walk alone, working in your cubicle alone at the office. Now, what I'm wondering is if some of you are sitting there and throwing these around in your head like, yeah, that one's social. Oh, that one, not so much, because that's what typically happens. We vote about this out loud. Well, if in your own home this evening, you answered that all of the environments require social, then you are correct. So how's a play date social, right? So many ways. And typically when I talk about this with educators or parents, we get um, a lot about, well, they have to talk to each other. And that's right, yeah. And they have to play with each other. And yeah, that's right. And then I always urge people to think a little bit harder. So if the play date is at one kid's house, what types of things are going on there? Oh, you have to share. You have to negotiate, take turns, problem solve, and the list goes on and on. There are there are so many things, right? Some of which can be categorized as social competence and some of which are social skills. For example, 
knowing if it's expected or not to go and open somebody else's refrigerator, for example, those types of things. So birthday parties. Okay. Once again, sharing space with other people, knowing that you don't just walk up and start eating the birthday cake before the birthday person has blown out their candles, knowing not to divulge what's inside the wrapped gift that you give and so forth and so on. Playground, all of that stuff. Um, approaching a peer, initiating play, entering into play that's already going. Even knowing hidden rules like you go down the slide and up the ladder. Now, granted, those aren't posted anywhere. If you notice, you don't walk into a park and it says only go down the slide. No, that's just something that people understand, right? Watching a movie alone at a theater is always a great one when we have this talk because a lot of people will say, no, but I really didn't define what that means watching a movie alone at a theater. That might mean that you go without your wife or husband, your friend, you just go alone. But are you necessarily alone in the theater? Maybe, maybe not. But there's, once again, I'm gonna use that word, all these hidden rules that have to do with where your feet should be placed. Well, definitely not on the seat in front of you, right? And if you've bought a bag of Twizzlers and you're one of those people that, I don't know, let's just say takes a minute and a half too long to open it because, and we all do this, right? We think that by doing it slowly, it'll make less noise. But what that actually does is it makes more noise and it causes people to have uncomfortable thoughts. Or you know that guy that laughs too hard and too long at the movie? Same kind of thing with sporting event. You know, you are sharing space with other people that you probably don't even necessarily know. Um, reaching across people to get food that's passed. And of course, we're all returning to this as think more and more things open up after COVID. But these are just ways that, that it can be social. Same thing with grocery shopping. You know, you ever notice that when you get over to where the eggs are, that there are so many choices, right? And you could be standing there with one or two other people and you don't necessarily know those people, but what you do is you reach up and you look at them and you go, excuse me, I was just getting that. And why do we do that? We don't even know that person, but we do that because we're sharing space with that person and we want them to feel comfortable around us. Because let's be honest, you're gonna see that person at the bread aisle or at the checkout, right? So that's the whole thing with social. We really, really want to behave or modify the things we do and say to keep other people comfortable. That's what it is to be social. And we could go down and down this list, right? Learning in a classroom, knowing when it's your turn to talk, um, not, you know, not monopolizing the entire discussion, um, joining the group, independent work, all of those types of things. Um, the drive through at Starbucks. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in line and someone is caught scrolling on their Instagram, and they're not looking up and looking around them, no, you're not necessarily in the car with that person. But that person is not thinking about the other cars in line at that moment. And so what is that person doing? Holding up the line. And then what happens in your brain? You have these thoughts and they're uncomfortable. And those thoughts lead to feelings, probably a frustration, right? Taking your dog for a walk alone. Here's another one, alone. And just because you're alone doesn't mean that you won't run into a jogger or somebody else with a dog. You know, are you following all the rules? Is your dog leashed? If your dog goes to the bathroom, are you picking up? Even if 
you are alone, there might be a neighbor across the street that's looking out their window and sees this whole thing going on and they could be having thoughts, right? Even with working in your cubicle alone at the office, you have to know how loud to be able to play your music. If you're a pen tapper, um, if you bring something smelly to lunch, what you're going to pick up on as we go deeper and deeper into this talk is that most of what we are discussing tonight has to deal with how well people share space with others. So Wikipedia defines social as living organisms, including humans, are social when they live collectively in interacting populations, whether they are aware of it or not, and whether the interaction is voluntary or involuntary. Miriam Webster defines it as marked by or passed in pleasant companionship with friends, excuse me, or associates of or relating to human society, the interaction of the individual and the group or the welfare of human beings as members of society, tending to form cooperative and interdependent relationships with others. <laughs> Once again, this is one of those interactive parts where I call on my participants to just speak up. Which words jump out at you as another word for social? Which words, as you are looking at this slide, and you can do this exercise on your own, define social for you? Okay, folks. These are the words that stand out, that cohesively define social, right? Being in a group, as I said earlier, and sharing that space, whether it's involuntary. What does that mean, involuntary? Well, let's go back to the grocery store. And I talked about being at the egg wall, right? Because there's grass-fed, organic, brown, white, small, medium, large, jumbo, there's all these choices with eggs. It's a big wall. And in order to get what you want, you're going to have to maneuver your body and accommodate other people's bodies moving in space. And we do this thing while we're there. When we reach in front of other people, we say things like, excuse me. And we do it in this ever most polite way. And we smile. And why do we do that? because we want the person that is next to us to have good thoughts about us. Because later, it could be five o'clock on a Thursday afternoon at HEB, and the line at each aisle could be five people back. Now, if you didn't take all of those niceties at the egg wall, you could get stuck in line with somebody giving you the stink eye. And that becomes uncomfortable. We as humans, we are constantly modifying our behavior in real time so that other people can be comfortable around us. Okay, let me give you an example of voluntary now. Voluntary relationships are interdependent with others. And there are others that you choose or you seek, right? because you care about their thoughts and feelings and those people care about yours. So for the purposes of this talk, and it's like broken recordville over here, but this is what we do when we share space with others and a host of daily activities that involve our social interpretation and related reactions. And that is how we define social. So another interactive um, guy that I like to do when I'm giving this talk is I like to kind of pull my participants about how they got to the talk that day. And there's a reason why I do that. And I lead them through all of these questions, which seem really obvious to participants and very confusing. Why would I be doing that? So indulge me, okay? Can you imagine a situation where you enter a room? Now this could be a PTO event. It could be your synagogue or church. 
um, a, it could be a sporting event, but I'm thinking more like little league, right? So now what I want you to do is I want you to imagine in your brain, how do you choose where to go? How do you choose who to sit by? What is your body doing in terms of its body language and changes based on who you are near, right? So for example, with a comfortable peer, you might be more relaxed, your body could be relaxed, your language is relaxed, the things that you're saying, you might be more talkative even. But with a stranger, it might feel uncomfortable, right? And so you're a little bit more poised in that situation. You wouldn't, for example, open up the dialogue with, tell me about your mother-in-law, right? We don't do those things with people that we don't know as well. And we don't do that because we don't want other people to think that we're weird, right? We don't um, start a conversation with an unfamiliar person about how terrible our boss is, right? We wouldn't do that. We ask things like, how are you? Oh, which one's your child? Oh, where does he go to school? because that's much more expected. Those are the things that tell other people, you can be comfortable around me. So that's a social experiment, right? So when I do it live, I have my participants actually get up and move to a location where they're sitting not with their stuff and not with the people that they came with, okay? What people start to understand is when you are put, even in, I, I'm wondering if as I'm asking you to imagine these scenarios, the first thing I'll direct you to is that you have thoughts about what's going on. And from those thoughts, you have feelings that are associated. Some of you, when you're in uncomfortable positions, situations with people, you might feel totally comfortable. You're very social, you're very extroverted, it feels good. Others of you might feel skittish and a little bit shy or unsure. And ultimately, what is going on there is a blending of all of these things, okay? What I'm gonna do right now, we're gonna watch another video. Meredith, tell me if this, this might not um, come up, so. When you shared your screen, did you tell it to share audio as well? Mm hmm Okay, cause it was really quiet last time. So let's see if it. Okay, um, let me. Okay, thanks, Mayor. Let's see. The gentleman in the elevator now is star. These folks who are entering the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat tries to maintain his individuality. But little by little, looks like he watched, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the camera subject. Here comes the camera stand. Three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been groomed. Fella with his hat on in the elevator. First, he makes 
makes a full turn to the rear, and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, you open the door, everybody's changed positions. <laughs> Oh, it's a good one. And I think what is so compelling about that video is how much of social is not even verbal. Isn't that amazing? Actually, the first step of communication. Oh, uh oh. Hold on. Sorry, folks. Um, what I was going to say is actually, the first step of communication is to think about a person. And all of that happens before we talk about things like the words we say, eye contact, our body language. You first have to think about another person. Think about that. That's absolutely amazing. So here we are. What just happened during that social experiment? Here it is. Context. Now remember, Charlie... I think that was the guy's name, or maybe it was somebody else. I don't know. But the gentleman in the elevator, he had to use his eyes really, really intentionally to figure out where he was and what was the purpose of being there, okay? How did he do that? Through social observation, okay? How did he figure out that people were gonna turn and then turn and then turn? Oh, by using his eyes and observing, right? And then what? Well, you don't want to be the only guy that's not facing the back of the elevator. So look what he did. He blended in. He matched the group. And not only did he match it, but he adapted really well, even though it made him uncomfortable. After all, they were facing the back of the elevator, right? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And then there's that self-awareness. Are you able to change things about yourself and use those compensatory strategies all the while to keep blending in and reading the context? You know, all of the things that we do when we are together with other people, we do simultaneously to keep other people having good thoughts about us. I know for me, all the while that I'm adjusting my behavior, I'm doing that based on your nonverbal as well as your verbal feedback. And I do that because I really want you to have good thoughts about me. And I want you to consider this for a minute. Children who have social learning challenges are not able to blend like that. Actually, backing up, they might not even be able to start by social observation so that they can read the room and the context and the purpose of what's going on. Our job, especially on our social learning team, is to help children do these things with greater success. Think about how many children seem rigid or have difficulty with flexibility. It's important to ask yourself, does this child realize where the group is? Does this child recognize that there is a group plan in motion? Does this child have an appropriate amount of awareness like the guy on the elevator so that the child knows to turn even if nobody says a thing? Self-awareness impacts communication style, right? And children, with limited self-awareness are really unable to alter their body language or maybe even their verbal language to make other people feel comfortable. So when social isn't intuitive, how does this look? 
Well, perceptions do get formed and some children get labeled, right? With older children, they might be discussed as self-centered or a loner, right? Or maybe even a jerk. And a younger child might be described as stubborn or fixated or a behavior problem. And unfortunately, kids might tease or bully and children who struggle could feel left out like other people don't like them. Here's the thing, think of social typical children, right? We all work on development of social competence all the side, all, all the time, excuse me. So consider the child with a vested interest and I want you to put this kid in your brain um, in Legos or Star Wars or Minecraft. I want you to think about if that child is able to talk about anything else. Is that child even able to consider the possibility that the people around them aren't interested like they are? Even consider the reality of our partially attending world. With the significant presence of screen time, like your iPad, your iPhone, your iWatch, we are all partially attending to each other in conversation, shared experiences, sporting events, movies, sometimes even at the same dinner table. You know, when your eyes are shifting between a screen and the people that you're sharing space with, it does interfere with your ability to read nuance and subtle cues. It does interfere with productive interactions and our children are growing up in this world. So it is important to consider this and have conversations in the home that might cause us to pause and consider when to and how to unplug so that we can help children develop these strategies and navigate more successfully socially. So social is sharing space with others. We have said this and we talked a little bit earlier about um, social and the classroom connection. Right away, kids have to be able to enter their classroom and figure out what's going on here, right? If a child is early, is there some warm up activity that is going on that they can come in and join? If they come in and the day has already started, do they have to figure out what materials they need and what activity they're jumping into? So they need to use clues to make guesses about what's going on and also what are the intentions of the other people they're sharing space with. Like I mentioned earlier, they've got to determine when it's expected to, to ask a question, when it's expected to listen, and then all the hidden rules that are there throughout the, door, the day. And let me just clear that up for just a second. A hidden rule is a rule that is not spoken and it's not written down anywhere, okay? So for example, you might walk into a classroom and you'll notice that all the desks face the teacher. Okay, well, there's not a sign on the wall that says face me, right? At circle time, there's not, there's not anything on the calendar that says face me, but yet it would be totally unexpected if a child came to those learning spaces and sat down like the man in the elevator facing in the opposite direction. That's an example of a hidden rule. Nobody talks about it, but all the children know to follow it, right? So the strategies that we talk about here really arm children. They also arm adults to be resilient. And resilience is so important because this gives us tools that we can utilize instead of freezing and not being able to do something important like read a room, return eye gaze, engage in conversation. The truth of the matter is that communication can break down anywhere and at any time. Look, it already did tonight. My video didn't work at one point, right? It broke down. And I didn't throw a tantrum or start crying and give up. I had a teammate here, it was Meredith. And she armed me with tools. And based on other events 
and things that I've experienced with Zoom, I just use that time to problem solve, right? Well, our children are watching our responses and they're forming their own social memory of how to communicate when communication breaks down. But here's the deal. Communication is not the only thing that can break down. Every day, we are faced with challenges and problems. And we have to be able to measure the size of that problem. Is it small? Can we make sure that the size of our reaction matches it? And then we can move on? Or is it a huge problem that we need to be able to get that grit going and find all of that, those tools to solve that problem and maybe even helpers? We've got to be adaptable and flexible and use our strategies. Um, a couple of years ago, I was super lucky. I got to go to New York City for the Learning in the Brain conference. And the subject of the conference was schooling the digital mind. And one of the keynote speakers was Temple Grandin. And for those of you who are not familiar with Temple, she is incredible. She is an adult living with autism. She is a speaker, she is an author, she is a PhD, she is a professor, and ag all things agriculture are what interests Temple. But one of the things that she talked about at the conference extensively was that she wants kids and adults getting their hands back on tools. Because what she noticed was that children were losing their capacity to use things like scissors and shovels and hammers. And one of the things that she said is because things don't always work and not everybody is going to be an influencer. And we have got to get ourselves, arming ourselves with physical tools, and communicative tools. So now that we understand that social spans across all environments and you're more aware of how to think about social, let's take a look at how to teach towards social competence. Okay, so a lot of times when we talk about social, um, you might hear people talk about it in terms of social skills. Right. Um, most often, I think I hear people talk about, gosh, he really had weird social skills or his eye contact was off. OK, so social skills are discrete. They're linear. They're rule based. Going back to that list that we had at the beginning, you know, that can be like, OK, don't open your don't open, you know, Jesse's present at the birthday party or, you know, don't cut in line say, can I play? Or say hi, safe hands, look at me, don't say that. These are social skills. And by the way, as parents, as educators, caregivers, we are working on these things with our children all the time. Why? Because if you're able to utilize these things, then actually you do a great job of making other fe people feel com comfortable around you. And you might be described as polite. But social competence is different. Social competence talks about the why we do what we do. And that implies complexity and dynamic systems of learning, including teaching social interpretation, critical thinking, self-awareness, perspective taking. That means that you understand that you have thoughts about things and that you that other people have thoughts about those things and some might be the same and some might be different, okay? Social competence is when people are able to know that they are being thought about, they're able to show others when they are thinking about them and they're able to use their eyes meaningfully to demonstrate that they're listening, paying attention, who they are speaking to or about as well as discover clues about the context and the intentions of others. So, you know, oftentimes when we talk to parents, one of the first things that um, 
a parent will say is, you know, I just want my kiddo to have friends or um, a play date or get invited to a birthday party, or I just want to have a conversation. And those are such beautiful goals. And we want those same things too. But when we are teaching social competence, we're going to need to back it up all the way to observation. Okay. In order to be able to talk about eye contact and body language, we need to make sure that first the child is able to observe other people, what they're doing, and then go from there because these are the building blocks of social. As early as infancy, infants perceive and learn new skills and they do this through observing or mirroring others, their actions and possibly their intentions. So even newborn babies, and you know, put your babies in your mind here. Think back to when you brought them home from the hospital, right? And you're cooing and you're going, <laughs> you're making all those sounds and babies about four or five months. And what's baby doing? <laughs> so they're cooing. They're mirroring your parent ease, your inflection, okay? Think about just even days home from the hospital, you do this to your baby. And your baby sticks their tongue right back out at you. Those are mirror neurons, okay? In early childhood and in teaching social competence in elementary school and so forth and so on, we must be explicit with our language to teach. We have to narrate our social observations versus narrating our expectations. Does that make sense, guys? So when you narrate your expectation, that kind of takes away a child's opportunity to practice inferencing. So for example, if you say, you know, um, that's inappropriate or you're in the wrong spot, everybody's over there, that child doesn't get the opportunity to stop and take in the context and figure out where their body should be. So if a baby is not imitating in infancy, they're gonna have to be explicitly talk, taught, excuse me. They'll need to be taught because imitation is necessary for play, for communication, academic learning and beyond. If you wanna improve social competence in the classroom or at home, you have to begin with stop and think. Where do you see the rest of the family is? Versus, hey buddy, go sit at the table. So one is a narrated expectation. The other involves critical thinking. Hey buddy, where's the family? Encourage your child to observe. Same thing. You know, our goal as parents should not be to focus on changing a behavior. Um, I know that's really tricky because we live in this immediate gratification world and that's what we want to do. We want to change behaviors. But if you focus on changing a behavior, you might notice that it might change in that context. But if you teach the concept and the why, you might begin to see that knowledge generalize. And the other thing to understand is that the learning really won't be immediate. You know, we have to go back and teach. So if you've got kids at home and siblings, you might say to one of your kids, you know, I see that Joey is building. I wonder what his plan is. You know, many children struggle to infer whether it's because of low perspective taking, low social attention, lagging skills, communication disorder, poor emotional self-regulation. You know, and as parents, we kind of expect children to follow the directions and ultimately infer what we're asking them to do. But, you know, have we actually taught them how to identify what that is? And what you can do is narrate out loud what you're thinking and your thought process. You know, 
once again, children can begin to identify that they have thoughts and that other people have thoughts. Once they can do this, they can begin to associate a relationship to how other people respond to the things that they do and that they say, right? It's really important for children to identify, hey, what are the people around me doing? What's my family doing? What's the goal right now? What's everybody's idea and what are they thinking about and what are they doing? I know that I'm running, um, time is running out, so I wanna make sure I get through everything here. The other thing that I would be super remiss if I did not touch on, and I need to pause here, and I wanna stress, that teaching social competence does not elicit immediate change, okay? This involves time, practice, and repetition in everyday interactions throughout the learning day, throughout the home life. And that's the best type of intervention for children who are maybe perceived to have behavioral challenges, okay? Here's what I'm present to about children. Children want to be successful. If a child is not successful, it is because something is underlying their perceived behavior or lagging skill, okay? Let's say you're at the grocery store and your kiddo wants a candy bar and you say, no. Your child then throws a fit and you leave the grocery store. And now the fit is even bigger because they're mad or sad. What if the language sounded like this? When you throw a fit, I feel mad. You don't get the candy bar, or you lose a privilege. What do you think I'm thinking right now? So what I just walked you through is a behavior map. By using this map, you're using language to help them link together their choices and the consequence that are associated. Well, you can do it for the positive too, right? So when we're in the grocery store, and you're able to cope with that and say, oh rats, you know, maybe next time. I'm gonna have a good thought about you because you made a small reaction to that problem and maybe there'll be some sort of reward at home. And then what kind of thoughts am I having? Really good ones, yeah. Hey Amy, we got a question. I know yeah. we're running short on time and you've kind of already answered this, but I wanna bring it together. Um, someone asked, so how does parish school help students with, on, with this area, with this subject? And I mean, what you just said was a lot of it, social behavior mapping, using this type of language. But if you want to expand on that a little bit. Yeah. And I'm so, thank you, Meredith. Thank you for um, bringing that question. So this, um, these strategies and um, these uh, teaching models come from the work of Michelle Garcia Winner. Um, and social thinking. And um, we're really fortunate on our campus. Um, I, for those of you who are familiar with Renee Attaway, she founded social thinking on our campus. And she happens to be one of 10 speakers in the social thinking collaborative um, who speak all over the country and beyond on behalf of social thinking. What's really special to our campus is that we have our own um, social learning program and our teachers and our speech language pathologists meet with Renee regularly to learn how to use these strategies in the classroom. But here's the deal, guys. I'm gonna show you um, some resources at the end of the talk. And the other great thing is be sure to go to www.socialthinking.com because there are so many free articles there and free webinars which is really, really helpful because I've used, and Meredith alluded to that, like social behavior map and thinking with your eyes and match the plan, body in the group. I've used some of these words tonight, but the truth of the matter is, is that each of these concepts gets its own webinar and they're free on their website. And what I think you will come to find is that the language is so user, excuse me, user friendly and it's so explicit. And then the other thing that I would say is please call on us. 
please reach out to our social learning team. If you feel that um, your child could benefit from those services, um, it's very easy to get in touch with the Caruth Center. And um, it involves, by the way, we serve children that are on the parish school campus as well as community kiddos. So that's an option as well. Um, I skipped through a couple, but I wanna be sure that I say this. You know, one thing that is really, really important is that children have to have social motivation in order to be able to receive this curriculum, in order to be able to understand the why we do what we do. Does that make sense? So for example, you know, do children want to have a friend to play with on the playground? Do they want a play date? Do they want someone to return their text message? Um, and th that can be described as social motivation, okay? So here are some other ways that you can support your social learners at home. And I talked about this, right, guys? Like narrating your thoughts, feelings, and actions. So um, observing others and making guesses about the thoughts, feelings, and actions of others. So probably not in Target, but if you observe different scenarios going on in Target, that might be a great conversation for when you get home. Hmm, what did you notice about that family? Hashtag child who grabs something off the shelf and runs down the aisle with it as if that's never happened to me. Just kidding. Anyway, but those are great, really great things to talk about. What they notice, what kind of thoughts that gave them, what kind of feelings that gave them. Um, going through your own thought processes when you're making decisions. Uh, going through, you know, this is something we do uh, on our campus a lot is we'll just go around doing observation scavenger hunts. So I'll ask the kids, I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll go into Meredith's office and she might be typing at the computer and I'll say, you know, what do you think Meredith's plan is? And, you know, sometimes the kids will say, she's going to touch her computer, you know, and I'll say, well, yes, that's what she's doing. But why is she doing that? And then they say, oh, she wants to send an email. So once again, all of this goes back to understanding why people do what they do. And engaging regularly with our children about social scenarios that they encounter through their day and talking about the thoughts and the feelings that surround them. Role-playing is really good. Um, social interactions between TV characters is fabulous. I have a group of kids that I see, and this week we did clips. Okay, imagine this, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. We did Veruca Salt, Mike TV, Violet Beauregard, and Augustus Gloop. All of those characters do things that are really unexpected. And they're so blatant and ridiculous that it's really easy for the kids to watch those things and talk about it. Charlie, old Charlie Brown cartoons are really good. Lucy always gets really up in Charlie Brown's face. Um, Disney has a bunch of digital shorts without any words and all the characters have really expressive faces. Um, oh, social media, you know, this is one where social can get really taken out of context. So um, this is a super big um, involved discussion, but I think it would be really important to monitor that. And especially, if, you know, the law kind of says if the child isn't 13, they probably shouldn't have an account, right? And if that child has a really difficult time interpreting the thoughts and feelings of others when they're face-to-face -face with people, they're really going to struggle with social when it's on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and those things. So it's, it's really, really important to um, be monitoring that. Once again, um, so here is an example of, um, something that might be really great to pick up and read. Um, another one that I really like is um, Me Thinking About You, You Thinking About Me. That's a great introductory book. 
going to the website at all, the social thinking website. Um, if you have a younger child who is more of the pre-K, um, you know, pre-K four, five, six, those years, um, because once again, that's really when um, these methodologies become most appropriate for a child. We wouldn't really want to begin with this earlier than those years. Um, you might take a look at the We Thinkers curriculum because that's really, really wonderful as well. And um, finally, I would direct you to our podcast, which is Unbabbled. And you can hear even more about social learning from Renee herself, because I know that we recorded an episode with her. And I think that that would be especially helpful as well. And then once again, if you feel that your child could benefit from um, social, social thinking, social learning, please contact us at the Carruth Center and the Parish School um, and, and we can kind of go from there. Uh, before we all sign off, I would love to reintroduce formally my one of my favorite colleagues, Meredith Krimmel, who is also a speech language pathologist and one of the hosts of our Unbabbled Con um, podcast and our director of admissions, Meredith. Thanks, Amy. Um, thank you guys all for coming. I know we have a few more questions coming through the chat. So Amy, if you wanna- um, I'll hang around. That's perfect. If wanna, people wanna hang and Amy can answer a few questions or um, what, whatever we don't get to, Amy can um, copy the questions and maybe email out. I wanted to say that this, um, this webinar will be emailed out to all attendees who registered, whether they, they actually came or not tonight. So all those resources will be available uh, to you through the emailed out um, recording. But I um, just want to thank you all so much for coming tonight. Uh, thank you, Amy, for presenting. I wanted to share some good news with you guys. We just heard from our COVID task force at the parish school that we are now allowed to host um, individual tours on campus by request. So if you are considering the parish school as an option for your child next year and you wanna come out and see it in person, we can now do that, which is wonderful. Um, so reach out to admissions at parishschool.org if you're interested in that. And um, to go along with that, we do have some availability in the fall at certain levels. So if you are interested thinking about parish school for the fall, uh, reach out to us and we'll let you know if we have space available in your child's age. But um, I'll let Amy jump back on and answer a few more questions. and. Um, Thank you guys all for coming. Oh, thank you, Meredith. Oh gosh, guys, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the feedback. Um, yes, so one more time, social learning is one of our programs at the Carruth Center. Stephanie Heinz is our social learning um, lead speech pathologist and she um, will be directly involved with uh, setting up those um, assessments if that's something that you feel um, your child would benefit from and we, we can go ahead and, and, and look into that with you. Meredith, what were some of those questions? Okay, so um, someone asked if, okay, uh, how can we help parents not feel guilty or that we're doing something wrong when our kids are having these issues. Um, most of the camps and overnight are overnights for kids um, with social needs and those kids might not be ready because of anxiety and special needs. And I'm gonna let Amy take this, but I did wanna, yes, we do offer some overnight camps through, camps through Caruth for children with social learning dif uh, difficulties, but um, there is not only social groups that are offered through the year through Caruth Center. Um, if social thinking is not the appropriate model, for your child, there are other um, Houston resources that provide social groups for kiddos, um, and we can get you those resources if you need those as well. Meredith, I'm really glad that you spoke up and, and said that because that's true. It you know, there are times when it might not be a fit, and that is something that's really really important to our process. We want to be a part of finding the right fit for your child. Okay, um, we'll do a couple more questions. Um, someone asked if we could share some success stories. Amy, do you have any success stories you'd like to share with some of our social learning kiddos? So I think a lot of our success stories can, um, 
and it's not just with a particular child, but I think it really speaks to how the children transition um, from our program and whether they, you know, whether they are parish school students and they go on to other campuses and whether they, you know, do not continue with the social learning program or keep coming back from it because we do know that social learning is an ongoing education type situation. But, you know, the types of success stories that we hear about are when our children, um, you know, parents, parents talk about dances that their child went to or um, taking part in a band, you know, or orchestra or performing, you know, in, in theatrical, I mean, we have people come back um, to our campus that were former parish school students and who benefited from the social thinking methodologies that are now staff members on our campus. And I think that those are the types of success stories that, that really resonate with me. All right, thanks. Um, someone just shared that they like to watch movies with the sound off and try to guess what's going on, um, which is a great, a great strategy, something we've used in our groups as well. Um, they said, especially because it might not be socially appropriate to speculate, speculate about others in Target when they're in, within earshot, which I thought was funny. For sure, which is why you <laughs> want to do that one, like I said, once you're in your car. Maybe removed from I'm, the situation. I'm so glad that you brought that up. That's great. And Another one oh, I'm recommended sorry. the movie, someone else recommended the movie Home. Um, it's an mm -hmm. animated film, which he does a lot of socially unexpected things. So that's a good one, too. Um, another really good one, I, even for um, older students, every week the Wall Street Journal um, sends out a picture with um, without words, without interpretation, and it does have some leading questions there, and it's a really um, great opportunity to just look at a picture of current events and, and to walk through with your kiddo, like, what do you think they're they're thinking about? What do you think the plan is? How do they feel about what's going on? Can, you know, can you make a smart guess about what happened? These are the types of words that we're starting to use. Awesome. Um, someone asked, are manners or etiquette classes recommended? Um, you know, I think that depends what your goal is. I'll, and Amy, you can kind of chime in. Um, I know in the past, some of our um, social learning therapists have focused on manners and etiquette, but from a social um, concept, using the social thinking concepts to kind of teach. Um, but Amy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, and, and you know, guys, we're always working on those things with our kids. And you know, my husband's a pediatrician. And one of the things that I love that he says all the time is we should always be talking to our kids. And if you're talking to your kids all the time, then likely you're always talking to them about etiquette. But here's the deal, right? Those types of things like etiquette and um, those discrete skills, they're, um, they might not apply to every situation. And they don't necessarily engage the critical mind, right? So they're very, very different um, than understanding than a child. So for example, if you're with a child that necessarily doesn't always greet other people, to work on etiquette with that child might be really um, missing a bunch of steps because the first thing that you might want to do is back up to, hey, buddy, stop and think. Where are we? Did you notice so-and-so is here? Oh, think about them with your eyes, right? So going back to what I said before, believe it or not, the first step of communication is to think about a person. So consider that if a child doesn't typically greet others, 
you might have to consider number one, is that child thinking about other people? Are they observing other people in their environment? Are they able to discover the context and why it would matter to somebody else that they greet them, okay? And these are all the things that we do when we back up with social learning. I may not be answering, and I saw a couple more questions come in about having dinner out and this, that, and the other, and I think that's getting really specific. And, and hey, I would love to sit down and talk about that. And, and if you'd like to, you can feel free to reach out to me, send me an email, alerman at parishschool.org or Stephanie Heinz as well, that she's in a, oh, she's the best. She's such an amazing resource. Um, but, you know, I think that's a much deeper conversation. Okay, last question, and then we'll close it down for the night. Mm -hmm. um, do these resources help children with the intellectual disability diagnosis? Hmm. So maybe not social thinking specifically as a curriculum, um, but there are other programs, um, especially in Houston, we have a lot of resources that help children with social um, concepts and social skills who might have an uh, IDD diagnosis. So if, if you'd like some resources on that, feel free to reach out to us and we'll help direct you that way as well. We're so fortunate, and I know Meredith would agree, on, on our campus, we have amazing partners in our community and just so many beautiful relationships with um, clinicians and schools and programs. And what we want to do is plug you in with the most appropriate um, placement for you and your child. And, you know, when you start getting into intellectual difficulties, that's not always going to be... Um, the right match for receiving social thinking methodologies, if that makes sense. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. Okay, guys, before we go, I would like to invite you to the second installment of our adult education summer series. Please tune in next week with Megan Rosales. Megan is a master's in education. And she is also our reading specialist to the elementary school on our campus. Megan will be talking with us about the five pillars of literacy. She's going to help us understand the foundation of our children's literacy skills. And I, I truly love this talk. I love this subject. And I think it's something that we can really all benefit from. So I hope I'll see you next week. And I will return to um, the Master of Ceremonies, and I'll let Megan do most of the talking. I feel so fortunate that you have joined us this evening. Once again, the recording will go out um, at a later date. And uh, hey, guys, thank you so much. We are so excited to be able to offer these um, education opportunities. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Good night.